Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Shira Uriarte, and I'm the program manager for member education at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's webinar, How is the Trump Presidency Changing American Jewry? Before we begin the presentation, just a few housekeeping details to share with everyone. Um, everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode. If you have questions during the presentation and are joining us on the web, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box you see on the screen. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, so if you have to jump off for any reason, rest assured you'll be able to listen at a later time that works for you. Um, a little bit about the Jewish Funders Network. So JFN works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective levels to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their impact as they make the change they want to see in the world. JFN leverages the power and creativity of networks to strengthen Jewish philanthropy around the world. And our year-round programming aims to keep members up to speed on the latest and most pressing topics in philanthropy in the Jewish community locally and globally. We aim to help our members build their philanthropic toolkits and explore relevant and important issues. So I'm so pleased this morning that we're going to be joined by JFN member and scholar, Dr. Stephen Winmuller. Dr. Winmuller will discuss how American Jewry has changed over the course of President Trump's presidency thus far. These waves of change in America include an upturn in anti-Semitism, an activist revival, political mobilization and polarization, shifts in philanthropic focus, and a cultural renaissance. Dr. Winmuller will explain all of these and more and why the American Jewish philanthropic community needs to understand these changes and respond to them. So a little bit about our, our speaker today. Um, Dr. Stephen Winmuller is the Rabbi Alfred Gottschalk Emeritus Professor in Jewish Communal Service at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in LA, um, a specialist on political issues and American Jewish affairs. Dr. Wimmuller holds a doctorate in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania and has held academic appointments at several major institutions of higher learning. He has served as a consultant and program resource specialist to a wide array of institutions, including the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, and the Jewish Federations of North America. So enough from me. Um, I'm pleased to turn it over to Professor Wim Mueller. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Shira, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'm most grateful to Jewish Funders Network for uh, inviting me to offer uh, some of these thoughts. And indeed, I think we live in an extraordinary moment, uh, not only in the history of the United States, but with significant implications for America's Jews. This uh, morning, I am seeking to provide a general overview of some of the trends that we are identifying and what those actually may mean for American Jewish institutions, for Jewish philanthropists, and for Jewish activists. Clearly, uh, the American Jewish community is bipartisan. There is a broad array of interests and support for the president, as well as a strong uh, and uh, present opposition to much of what he has to offer. So the focus here is really to explore the realities of where we are as a Jewish community and as Jewish uh, citizens. The next slide, please. I wrote a piece on the uh, 19th of June for e-Jewish philanthropy that began to sort of lay out some of the trends that I began to study and observe in the context of the first six months of President Trump's uh, service in office. Clearly, the political re-engagement of Americans uh, would be the highlight of this, but it would have some significant uh, philanthropic and financial implications as well. And those, of course, we will want to look at in the context of the next few minutes. Next slide, please. I think in stepping back to the election itself, 
in November, it is important to understand that this may have been the first American election in the past 100 years in which American Jews did not vote in the same high levels of engagement as they had in previous uh, contests. Historically, we generally held to the principle that 85% of American Jews participate in the political process. Yet in this election, we can now account for a number of factors that have lowered that uh, level of, of engagement. The first having to do with the Brandeis University study pointing to millennials and many Jewish millennials who supported uh, Bernie Sanders and elected in the end not to cast votes for Hillary Clinton or any other candidate. Brandeis suggests in that study that eight to 10% of American Jewish millennials may not have voted as a result of that decision. Likewise, on the Republican side, we find a number of Jewish Republicans <clears throat> who were not prepared to support Donald Trump and therefore elected or opted not to vote or voted for third party candidates as a type of protest. In both situations, I think we understand that there is a changing perspective about the role of the American Jewish voter. Indeed, being very selective and not necessarily even participatory in the historic contests that sort of have defined Jewish political uh, behavior. A second factor in this election uh, would call to mind the fact that the Jews were heavy donors to both of the major campaigns. Uh, we believe that Hillary Clinton's top five donors were Jewish and that in looking at a survey of Donald Trump's top 20 donors, seven of these donors happened to be Jewish. This in part may change the role that we see American Jews playing in the political framework. That we're once seen as heavy duty committed voters, we now see the rise of their financial clout as being significantly more important and maybe reshaping their role in American politics as being a primary or a significant funders to campaigns. We also can observe the new Jewish constituencies that have emerged over the last number of election cycles, the presence and growth of Orthodox Jewish voters, the significant engagement of Israelis, Persians, and Russian Jews who have now sort of matured in terms of their engagement and, and involvement with the political cycle, and their impact on the Jewish vote ought to be seen as significant and uh, certainly constitutes an area of which we need to study further developments. Next slide, please. What we have observed since November are really um, these six factors. I would point to several of them as being particularly important. The large numbers of people who have been seen at demonstrations and at public events, uh, the reports we receive from rabbis and others about significant turnout of people to gatherings both within their congregations and across the community. We also note that voter registration, even though this is an off year period, has clearly uh, jumped as many Americans who did not participate or who were not registered to vote, including a number of American Jews, have found it important to register at this point for future elections. No doubt, as we all are aware, as reported both by the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty uh, Law Center, the increased levels of anti-Semitism, of acts of hate, of the rise of groups uh, on the political right that have created concerns, not just for American Jews, but for a wide array of groups interested in the welfare and security of, uh, of uh, American citizens. The interesting thing in number four, having to do with financial commitments to specific causes, is the reality of where people are investing or funding projects now as against prior to November of last year. We will take a deeper look at some of that data in a few moments. Clearly the fifth premise, the rise of political activism, is seen by huge increases in memberships of various groups 
and the acceleration of participation by folks who may have ordinarily not seen the need to be active at this point, whether they are pro-Trump or anti-Trump, the reality is that political activism in America has accelerated over the course of this past year. And finally, we see actually the evolution of some new forms of political activism and, and connections, and this having to do with the fact that groups are emerging that are specifically targeting or interested in, in particular, single issue causes or in reaction to the White House or in support of the president. And that has triggered some new political activities that we would not have identified uh, earlier. Next slide, please. I think that one of the keys to understanding uh, the last uh, 11 months is really to take a look at what I guess I call the trigger dates or trigger events. Clearly the day after the election would generate a huge impact and upflow of donations to various projects and charities in reaction to the election of President Trump. Indeed, in the early months of uh, the president's tenure, especially following the executive order dealing with what was called the uh, entry ban on, uh, on certain countries being permitted uh, to have their citizens enter the United States, that too would trigger both demonstrations and a new arising of political uh, participation. And also this would be expressed in some levels of financial acceleration of giving to causes that would be pushing back against the order, or in some cases uh, in support of the president's initiative to isolate groups coming into the United States. No doubt, August 12th of this year, the events following Charlottesville would again generate a kind of trigger moment where we would see a good deal of both written commentary, but also um, political um, reactions. And interestingly enough, as we would well expect, the results of the hurricane relief, while not political in nature, uh, would be another sort of measuring point for financial as well as political uh, comments and activism in terms of the question of climate change or the issue of how responsive government can or ought to be in dealing with uh, the results of natural disasters. Next slide, please. In the course of the past year, I think we can pretty well conclude that there has been an increase in support for various types of political think tanks and policy organizations, both on the right and the left. The rise of uh, the Democracy Alliance and the Center for American Progress, which are groups on the left, have been demonstrated by their levels of support, uh, a good deal of interest on the part of donors who want to um, begin to shape a kind of counter Trump policy. But likewise, we see support for the Heritage Foundation and other groups on the right that have generated some interesting uh, and positive responses to support some of the uh, Trump uh, White House initiatives. Specific causes in particular have uh, created a good deal of interest on the part of donors to support organizations com committed to uh, the protection of the climate to dealing with issues of immigration, to being responsive to criminal justice concerns, and to civics education. And I would like to point out with civics education, the reality that many donors, including many Jewish participants, have noted that one of their great concerns is the absence of uh, stronger numbers of people being involved in the political process, either as voters, or as knowledgeable about political issues, which has prompted a good um, amount of effort to generate support for civics education and civic uh, political activism as a way to figure out how do we bring more voters and more people back to the political process than we have seen in the last uh, uh, 20 or 25 years. Because we note that the voting patterns in the United States in general have shown a decrease in the number of Americans actually voting and participating in elections, whether at the state, local, or at the federal level. 
One of the interesting uh, things to, to, to note about the uh, general giving patterns has been actually the number of Americans who today are buying newspapers again. And in particular, the Washington Post, the New York Times have reported significant increases in their readership and in the per purchases of subscriptions to those papers and others that mainstream media has seen a clear um, acceleration of uh, attention and support, uh, something that I think was certainly not necessarily expected as an outcome of this election. One of the things we will look at in the future certainly will be as the new uh, Trump budget proposals for 2018 move forward, uh, how will foundations and donors respond to these shifts in terms of the government's priorities? And at what point will they seek to either make up or uh, provide support for certain uh, institutions and causes that they see significant uh, to the, uh, their interests and to the interests that they perceive uh, of Americans in general? Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think we also can um, generally concur, although we do not have clear data here, that some of the core institutions that are not seen as heavily embracing uh, some of the political issues we've already referenced and we'll talk about later, um, probably have not done as well and have probably seen some potential drop-offs. And here again, I would cite in general ways Israel-related charities, and some single-issue causes that may sit outside the sort of boundaries of, of what we uh, would call politically hot-button uh, issues. And again, even umbrella groups uh, may not have been uh, as most favorably uh, targeted here because uh, I think donors are increasingly directing uh, much of their giving to very specifically based causes that are of interest to them in uh, in the period now that has followed this election. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think when looking across the board, we've seen an uptake, a huge uptake in some of the particular charities uh, cited on this slide. Some are related certainly to healthcare issues and to the welfare of women and women's issues as cited by the significant um, uptake in Planned Parenthood. Some religious communities have reported a growth in terms of, of participation and affiliation as cited here um, by the Council on American Islamic Relations. Other groups like the Sierra Club have reported uh, that in November, for example, of last year, they quadrupled their monthly donation records. And likewise, we see similar reports uh, from the ACLU and uh, various other um, civil liberties groups who have reported record-breaking numbers in terms of charitable support and new gifts. Uh, like with all of these, we note as well that the ADL has reported a similar, uh, as they uh, would indicate, a 50-fold increase in online donations, of which they identify 70% as first-time donors. Next slide, please. This is simply a, a citation taken from uh, the Jewish Forward uh, earlier this year in which there is a reference to the fact that uh, three organizations reporting some uh, high profile donor uh, increases. Already we've talked about the ADL, but here the National Council of Jewish Women is cited um, as, uh, as well as American Jewish World Service. Next slide, please. It is kind of interesting to look at some very specific areas to sort of see what has changed and what continues to be changing. As I noted earlier, I think those interested in policy making and policy process have actually been very heavily engaged in support of both left and right uh, think tanks. And uh, I simply want to accelerate that point here by having referenced it uh, earlier, but to, to remind ourselves that people are looking in many ways at the longer term questions of policy and how it will evolve. The second area, of course, are the specific elections that were held during the course of this year, the Georgia 6th, the South Carolina 5th, 
the Montana House seat among others, as well as the Alabama Senate. And in each of those cases, we saw very significant donor participation from both within those states, but certainly well beyond uh, as donors, including uh, a fair number of Jewish uh, activists uh, elected to participate in, in these uh, elections that were sort of seen as bellwethers or measures of how well the Trump administration was being um, regarded by voters and uh, in terms of also changing potentially the distribution of power in the United States uh, Senate and House. As I also cited, uh, the increase in, in the kinds of mainline media that were receiving uh, significantly larger numbers of subscribers and here is uh, a list of a partial group of those. And finally, um, to point out that the Republican Party and the Trump campaign itself continues to raise a significant amount of money, and indeed within the first six months reporting over $100 million in new assets, and in some of these events hosted in part by groups such as the Republican Jewish Coalition or Friends of Donald Trump from within the Jewish community, I think we need to um, identify the fact that there is certainly a significant Jewish uh, upbeat response to support here as well. Next slide, please. I think the interesting question ahead of us will be the 2018 federal budget. And I had occasion uh, earlier to write about the budget in an e-Jewish philanthropy piece in the spring of this year in which I began to sort of take a look at the budget's projections as to what it would look like and to identify uh, some of the realities of, of, of areas that would be impacted that have implications for the uh, Jewish community in particular. Um, and referenced in that article that uh, the roughly $10 billion in federal monies were uh, at uh, different points along the uh, budgetary lines directed to Jewish uh, institutional causes, especially in areas of family uh, service care, Jewish hospitals, Medicaid and Medicare uh, coverage, uh, and, and nursing homes. So uh, there are significant implications if there are uh, going to be a major budget cuts in the social service field for the Jewish community, and what effect will that have on donors and certainly its implications for the delivery of services in the Jewish community. And I cite here uh, just a few of the areas in which the Jewish community could be adversely or partially affected, um, including after school enrichment programs, uh, film festivals that are eligible to receive certain federal uh, grants or, um, or resources, and various other educational initiatives uh, that have in the past benefited. But likewise, as the uh, administration seeks to move some of its priorities, the question will ultimately arise whether Jewish day schools will actually be uh, the new beneficiaries of support and whether in the shift of both uh, policy and budget, uh, whether there will be some other advantages to some aspects of the Jewish community that historically were seen as outside of, of, of budgetary support, certainly by the uh, federal government. Next slide. So in a sense, what we have been offering uh, this morning was a kind of overview of the, the picture of, of, uh, of where the American society as a whole is and where the Jewish community in some very specific ways uh, might uh, understand or see uh, itself. I would just summarize by noting uh, just a few core uh, factors that uh, we are seeing a kind of uh, Trump bump the reaction to Donald Trump, whether for him or opposed to him, has created a significant amount of activism on the part of Americans in general and the Jewish community in particular. We have seen the rise of some new organizations and groups, uh, including a group on the West Coast called Jews United for Justice and Democracy, which is drawing very large numbers to their events and is seen as a kind of response to what uh, I would say suggest progressive Jews see as some problematic issues of concern uh, to, uh, to the Jewish community and American society uh, as a result of the uh, Trump presidency. But likewise, we see a sort of renewed activism on the part of Republicans who have rallied to the president's uh, 
positions on Israel and other matters that have energized them in the course of the past year. So I think at this point I will conclude my remarks and I welcome the opportunity to entertain questions. Professor, thank you so much. Um, so at this point, I want to encourage people who are joining us via Zoom to ask questions with the Q&A box that you should see on your screen. What we can do is, if you have questions, um, we can, you can type them in there, um, and then I can promote everybody to to panelists who would like to ask their question live. So why don't we just pause for a moment or two and let people collect their thoughts and hopefully we'll get um, some questions coming in so we can really get this discussion started. So let's just hang tight. So this is Shira from JFN. So I think we have a shy group here. Um, I will, I'll pose a question to you, Professor, and, and hoping that we'll get, oh, we actually had one came in. Um, Marla, would you like to ask your question? Hang on just a second. Hi, Marla, would you like to ask your question? Okay, I'm gonna ask it for Marla. Perhaps her, her microphone isn't working. So she says, um, Steve, thanks so much for your insights. Going forward, any recommendations for the Jewish nonprofit sector? particularly legacy institutions that are trying to carve out their traditional space in an era where the non-traditional organizing and organizations are accelerating their presence. Hi, Marla, good to hear from you and a great question. Uh, legacy organizations have obviously a number of challenges that extend beyond even the political issues of the Trump presidency. Um, I think they are uh, generally focused uh, on, on trying to sort of uh, sustain their place in, in the marketplace to, to, to certainly brand themselves or in some cases rebrand themselves in order to, to grow their, their share of, of the of connection and engagement. Um, I think it's interesting that this is precisely the moment in which some of the legacy organizations may want to return to their core mm -hmm. values and mission because as with the National Council of Jewish Women or with a, a variety of other groups, the, the issues that may actually um, bring people to the table will be the issues of, uh, of uh, certainly the status of women and their rights and, uh, and their well-being uh, if, uh, if you're projecting a kind of 
um, uh, a, a set of concerns about whether the Supreme Court may take actions that would uh, reverse a Roe v. Wade or do other things to endanger uh, some of the rights of, of women so that uh, clearly legacy groups may want to rethink first original mission and, and, uh, and values. The second having to do with the fact that I think we're seeing a great deal more of uh, collaboration and coalition building in this era than we've seen before. And that affords groups the opportunity to find partners, whether they be boutique or, or uh, the single issue constituencies that have more recently uh, emerged, or whether that might involve um, other legacy groups uh, aligning together around some common uh, interests and actions. A third uh, posture that, that I think is, is, uh, is called for at this point uh, may well involve the ability of some of our, of our legacy organizations to take some steps here that take them out of their comfort zone, that actually begin to move them in ways that uh, sort of are countercultural to their histories, uh, where they actually organize and, and take their programs away from the sort of institutions around which they are identified. In some cases, it may be the synagogue, and in other cases, it might well uh, um, be community um, agencies and to begin to move their presence and their operational um, uh, sort of uh, points of, of uh, connection um, to, to really touch a millennial generation, which is less loyal to institutions, but is very um, committed to causes and uh, for people to sort of see that the cause overrides the institution. And this is no way suggesting that we negate the value of the synagogue or the importance of a JCC, but it is to suggest that bringing people to the table is not necessarily bringing them in to the walls or within the walls of our existing institutions. So the virtual kind of communities that are emerging may require some of our legacy groups to also become rebranded in part as being uh, flexible and mobile enough to, to work outside of the walls of, of their, uh, of their uh, legacy uh, foundings. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, we have um, another question. What resources should Jewish funders use to learn more about how to respond to the world in the Trump era? Oh, I, that's also quite a uh, interesting and maybe a more complex question than uh, one would imagine. I mean, I think here we have a very divided American constituency and we need to acknowledge that up front and that American Jews are sitting on all of these different spectrums of politics. And that is a very different sort of framework um, for uh, some of our organizations uh, to think about because historically they could move in a kind of lockstep manner. And that may not be possible for, for many of our institutions who um, need to take into account that we have a, an array of different political perspectives amongst our, 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 uh, our members. Uh, so that creates a, a different kind of responsibility on the part of, of institutions. One of the pieces that people are asking for and that maybe we need to pay some attention to is that they're not necessarily looking always for places that embody their point of view, but what they are looking for are places for civil and comfortable conversations where uh, those who disagree with them are in, uh, invited in, in in terms of a dialogue about uh, what does all of this mean uh, for American Jews, what does it mean for America, and how might we find some common ground in the context of what uh, we're struggling with in terms of these great divisions. So the first piece of this is to sometimes think of our roles as being um, menders, creating opportunities for institutions to uh, open their doors, in a sense be the big tent to welcome in diverse points of view for the opportunity of political discourse. The second uh, possibility here is that this may be a moment in time in which the Jewish community confronts the reality that we are actually multiple communities and that we need to pay attention to the fact that 
if we believed at one time there was a kind of a Jewish uh, public policy position or positions, that today we find a community that, that really um, has to think of itself as sort of different sets of silos or sub-communities that are participating in now the fifth generation of American Jewish life on this continent. And that is a new reality for us to uh, sort of confront that the resources we once had of a kind of unif uni the unification of the Jewish community around central issues has uh, dissipated. And that we are a community with multiple generations, with very diverse uh, experiences and uh, education, uh, with a high degree of, um, of differing perspectives about what it may be to be an American Jew in the 21st century and confront that reality by speaking to distinctive audiences within, within the community that share our points of view, um, which is a different model for community or community development than we have seen in the American experience. Um, but as uh, Rabbi Chaim Herring and I recently wrote, uh, we really think that in the new mapping of the American Jewish community, we will see uh, a, a great debate about really what constitutes community, and are we in fact a community, but emerging ultimately as, as multiple communities, which will change the very character of these conversations about uh, speaking about a kind of Jewish collective voice. Thanks so much, Professor. We have a question that came in from uh, Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence. Um, and their question is, is support for Israel the main justification for Jews to support Trump? Is support for Israel the main justification for Jews to support Trump? Well, there certainly are American Jews who have embraced Donald Trump specifically around his uh, Israel uh, uh, agenda. But I will tell you from what data we do have about American Jewish voting and American Jewish Republican behavior is that we have an array of interests on the part of, of American Jews who have embraced Donald Trump. Uh, the 24%, according to the New York Times exit poll that supported uh, President Trump in the November election, reflects a kind of um, different set of, of interests. You have Jews interested in, um, in the day school movement and in uh, federal support, public support for uh, um, private or, or parochial uh, Jewish education. You have other Jews who've come to the table um, on behalf of, of the Republican Party and Donald Trump, who are deeply interested in the tax policies of the party and uh, really have come because of economic interests to sort of grow the American economy and they believe which will enhance um, opportunities for themselves and others uh, in ways that they haven't seen um, in, in many uh, decades. And a um, still other group who are really concerned about American national security, um, at times aligned with Israel, but also separate from Israel in terms of building a strong American um, posture in terms of fighting terrorism and protecting the United States from uh, external threats. So I think one has to look at at um, the Republican response to Donald Trump as coming from many places. And as I noted in my formal presentation, there is a significant percentage of Republican voters who did not support President Trump, who remain deeply committed to Republican values and to the party, uh, but have uh, reservations about the Trump presidency. So I think that all of this together uh, cites uh, the fact that uh, that the support for Trump on Israel is but one of the parameters of measure uh, for how he is perceived in, 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 the, uh, in the Republican ranks. Thank you so much. Another question has come in um, from Adam. Adam, do you wanna ask your question live? If not, I can, I can ask it for you happily. I'll give you just a second to respond. Okay, I'm gonna ask it for you. So what are the reasons for the increase of anti-Semitism in America? 
is it mostly coming from white supremacists or radical left or radical Muslim or a combination of? Uh, Adam, thanks for your question. Antisemitism, I think, is a, is a very complex uh, issue in terms of measuring um, some of its seeds, but I'm going to suggest to you that we have, uh, for the first time, I think, in American history, a, an experience that we have not encountered before, which is that we are seeing antisemitism from both the right and the left. We've seen it at times from both, from each side separately, but now suddenly we see uh, aspects of it appearing in, in both camps, and that is indeed problematic. Uh, I'm going to separate out here the question of the role of Islam per se and Islamic sort of pushback against Jews as, as a separate question for a moment, because I really think there are some American issues here that, that have triggered uh, this round of anti-Semitism. Uh, and um, uh, first, I would suggest that um, uh, in studying a bit about the alt-right, I think we, we begin to sort of see some of the features of what it re has represented and what it, it's seeking to represent, which is really a pushback against what is happening in the uh, country in general. And Jews are simply seen as a sort of a piece of, of the problem or the story in their minds. Uh, by the year 2043, most everyone amongst major demographers in the United States believes that the United States will cease to be a white majority country, that the country's diversity will be fully formed and that uh, the nation will be uh, a society of multiple cultures, races, and ethnicities, which we already begin to sort of see in many of our urban corridors, but this will have a much more profound effect over the next 30 years. That pushback by some on the right to sort of suggest that the North European model of America is in danger. And I think in part that is driving much of the alt-right's image to sort of re-establish um, whiteness in America. And the question that was raised interestingly enough in an Atlantic magazine article in early December of 2016 was a piece about are Jews white? And the whole question of the whiteness of American Jews is part of the debate and the pushback by some in the alt-right against, against American Jews as not being really part of the, of the European, North European story um, and cultural values that they, they are arguing for. But that's but one of the features of what we are up against. The second feature is uh, called, I, I guess for a lack of a better term, identity politics, where groups including Black Lives Matter and various groups in the Hispanic community and groups uh, um, across the board have been pushing for the fact that intersectionality ought to be the framework for their coalition, for their activism. And intersectionality suggests that the victimhood of one of us is the victimhood for all of us. And arguing in that context, well, Jews don't fit in that. They are not, first of all, victims in America. They are part of the establishment in America. And secondly, they are the funders and supporters of a Jewish state, which this sector on the, uh, uh, of the intersectionality group calls uh, problematic because uh, Jews are seen as oppressors in the context of Israel. So the intersectionality piece has been a bond that has driven the groups on the left uh, to coalesce uh, in part uh, around BDS and in part um, on attacks on Israel in more general ways. And growing out of some of that are, are old line ideas on the left, uh, some of the anarchists, some of the socialist groups that have been recreated in the last number of years as part of the um, uh, groups that have formed a kind of um, pushback against the all right. And there you also have some strains of anti-Semitism um, of uh, Jews as part of uh, the oppressor class and as part of American, uh, of the American problem rather than its solution. So what we have here is a, a interesting cross section of various ideas, right and left, that have found common ground today in uh, seeing Jews as highly visible, and is particularly problematic in terms of uh, their achieving, that is, uh, these groups achieving some of their goals to change America. On the one hand, to change it to being, again, a white society, and on the other, to allow for the sort of uh, 
a gathering of the various uh, minority voices and uh, ethnic communities to, to uh, assert their rights and their e equal status. So uh, I think the, these are some of the internal challenges that are strikingly present in creating the new anti-Semitism. Uh, the Islamic factor in America is less profound as it is in Europe, and that is why I've sort of separated it. We don't see the same kind of radicalized uh, 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 anti-Jewish um, responses from many or most of the circles within the Islamic communities of the United States. And I'm not su suggesting that, that uh, we ignore what has been said or done in certain um, uh, quarters of the Islamic uh, American community, but the reality is that that is highly um, uh, um, overplayed in the United States as against what we are seeing elsewhere in the world. Thank you so much. We have a handful of really amazing questions that have just come in. Um, I'm just going to go in order to be fair, uh, but let's see if we can squeeze them all in in the time that we have left. Um, this question came from uh, the Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island, um, providing with the next election, we have a Democrat in the White House, do you foresee the continuous uptick in philanthropic giving, or would you assume it would fall flat, though still remain higher than pre-Trump? Well, that's very difficult to project. I think we're generally projecting the uptake in, in political giving and political activism through 2020. Um, but beyond that, it's been very difficult and very few people are forecasting any uh, significant uh, reports or, or giving any data to suggest uh, anything beyond 2020 at the moment. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to suggest. I, I do think that we are seeing a new Republican Party emerge, and that is in part shaped by the imprint of Donald Trump, and that will be an interesting question whether that will will grow uh, should he not win re-election and should he win re-election will it become really the centerpiece of republicanism in america which was really one of the, the fascinating issues uh, uh, before us great another question um in what ways have you seen jewish collaboration and coalition building as a funder of Jewish institutions, how can we help encourage this in our communities? Collaboration and coalition building is frankly uh, critical at, at this point. It, is, it's, it strikes me that um, other communities are moving much faster in terms of building uh, these networks of, um, of responses, if you wish, or participatory action. Um, uh, the Jewish community has historically lived with silos. It grew up on the premise that we were sort of built, building, as we did with American business, a competitive model for American philanthropy, for American Jewish philanthropy and American Jewish uh, social and religious practice. And I think that that is a concept of the 20th century that needs to be or revisited here in the 21st, simply because the costs of doing the kinds of things that institutions and leaders want to accomplish simply cannot happen with the kind of weightiness of the, of the structures that we currently have and the needs to, to sort of refine and, and reconfigure what communities look like as we move forward. The role that philanthropists can play here is to really be challenging to the donor base that they are supporting to, in a sense, create as part of the donor configuration uh, of support an expectation that um, grants are given and funding is, is underwritten with, with uh, coalitional um, structures in mind and outcomes to, to sort of measure how we grow relationships uh, between and amongst Jewish institutions rather than simply perpetuate um, these sort of silo models of community. Great, thank you. Um, another fabulous question from Marla came in and she, she'd like me to read it for, for her. Um, so with a recognition that we are really many different communities, who can claim to speak for the Jewish community? 
if no one can speak to what the Jewish community stands for and no voice can articulate, quote unquote, the Jewish values at stake, will our role in the political arena be diminished? And if we have no particular role, will we lose whatever power we have in the political arena when it comes to Israel advocacy, et cetera? Um, Marla has probably been reading some of my articles in which I do bemoan the fact that political power is corollarily tied, it's directly tied to the ability of a constituency to hold the center and to be able to articulate a shared agenda. Uh, and that becomes increasingly difficult, as her question uh, suggests, in terms of our ability moving forward to, to market or to manufacture such, such sense of unity in the community. There are two streams here that could change or alter what I see right now happening, which is this sort of bifurcation of the community. And the two pressure points are the continued rise of anti-Semitism as a threat to Jewish security, which will uh, force the community to figure out ways to coalesce with one another. And the second, growing threats to Israel and to Israel's security, which will be the second avenue by which the Jewish community will uh, find a need or will create the response for a renewed uh, sort of central message. Outside of these external threats, there is little in my view that will bind the community or create the kind of uh, consensus of action that uh, would, uh, would hold our power and hold our position together. The interesting thing about Israel, however, is that if one pursue, or presumes that Israel is tied as an American Jewish issue, I think that's probably a, a misreading, that Israel is an American foreign policy interest and that the interests behind that of a vast array of different constituencies, Jewish and non-Jewish, is a very important premise to how we have built and will sustain the pro-Israel um, agenda. But beyond that, in terms of how American Jews will understand or relate to Israel, whether it has to do with the question of uh, a one state or a two state solution, whether it has to do with the issues of settlements, whether it has to do with religious pluralism or a host of other questions internal to how Israel is seeing itself as Israel, as a, a democratic uh, Jewish state, uh, those questions will continue to, I think, uh, be debated internal to the Jewish community. I, I also uh, sense that there isn't a demise in the support for the notion of a Jewish state. I think the debate is over the character and the content of that state, but the question of statehood and its viability, I still believe remains uh, central. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, so it looks like we don't have any more questions that have come in at this point. So I guess we will end a couple minutes early. Um, thank you so very much for, for uh, starting to engage our community uh, with this, this very, very important discussion. Um, the questions that have come in, really, really fabulous. Thank you everybody for asking and participating. Um, and Professor, really, thank you very much for, for your time and energy putting this, this presentation together. Um,